Welcome to the Metaphoricist Magazine podcast, your home for beautifully made speculative fiction. The magazine is edited by B. Morris Allen, and I'm your host, Matt Gomez. This week's story is The Fool Who Sings You to Your Grave by Katie Servanek. Katie Servanek is an earbuds in writer in the evenings and a commercial interior designer by day. She enjoys sushi, learning about trees, and dabbling in vegetable gardening. She aspires to read 50 books a year, but has never quite made it. She's an active member of the Lexington Writers Room and lives in Lexington, Kentucky with her husband and teenage triplets. Find her online at katieservanek.wordpress.com. That's K-A-T-I-E-C-E-R-V-E-N-E-C.wordpress.com or on Twitter at Read Ka Serve. That's R E A D K A C E R V. Let's jump in. I'm not superhero fodder. The cape, the muscles, the dewy eyed drive to save the world while sweeping back Kendall hair, that's not me. I'm a mediocre Great Clips visit, brown hair, graying at the temples. I'm a pudge that hangs over my seatbelt, especially when I cram into the jeans I wore years ago in community college. I've got my window down. It's a warm, windy day in November. My stomach flops when I stop at the next red light and look to my right. Cavill, aka Cav, sticks his trunk or tanned arm out the window of his red Chevy pickup and gives me the head bob nod from the second lane over. His eyes literally twinkle when Robert Plant starts up on his radio, singing about that lady and her stairway. I'm surprised it's Led Zeppelin and not Alan Jackson or something with achy breaky twang. Over the chug chug of his idling V8, Cav belts out the words. Holy wailing rock band Batman, he cannot sing worth a crap. Mouth wide, he looks over at me with eyes that crinkle against the sun setting light. They're always light drenched and full of joy, the ones that listen to old rock songs. I fit my nails to the divots in my Mazda's gray speckled upholstery and force my lips into a tight-lipped smile. The same song plays on my radio, too. We sing together, terribly. Then the light turns green. He gives his head a shake, grinning at me from ear to sunburnt ear. As he rolls away, I hear him whoop out the next verse. My hands shake. At the next light, I pull over and hyperventilate in a Rite Aid parking lot, because I saw it all when the song started. I know his name. I read it in the air, but there's more after that. It hovers before my eyes. Bolded text, backlit by the lowering sun. An obituary. Tomorrow's. Cavill Watts Johnston, age 47, died in Seaverville, Tennessee on November 16, 2022. He is survived by two children, his fiance, and his beloved dog, Callie. He was preceded in death by his parents, Watson and Cherie Johnston, and his sister, Joanne Dernst, nay Johnston. In lieu of flowers, the family requests donations be made to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, Construction Program, or the Golden Retriever Rescue Society. Three months ago, I called into one of those dumb radio contests. Didn't win. But the static that came over the line right before I hung up? Ear-splitting, stomach-wrenching. Something happened. Something wrong. Ever since, I've been singing radio lullabies with the imminently screwed. Not sure why this ability attached itself to me. I don't want it. Don't want to talk or to sing with or help anyone. Don't want anyone helping me. I do best on my own. A tap on the driver's side window pulls my head from the steering wheel. Are you okay in there, mister? A young woman asks. She's holding tight to the hand of a toddler. Just narrowly missed a fender pinder, scared the sh- I looked down at the kid. Shook me up. I'm fine now. Do you need help? Want me to call anyone? No, I answer. More gruffly than I meant to. I'm fine. Great because it's easier than saying I just witnessed a stranger's last earthly moment of joy. It's easier than explaining the truth of my lonely superpower. Every time I hear the same song as a stranger, and we sing along together, 
I know right then they're going to die that day. Yeah, I'm great as hell, lady. She hurries away. I lean back against the headrest. At first, I didn't realize what was happening. There was the couple just over the state line. I was on my way back from a parts inspection in Kentucky. I'd stopped at a gas station for a piss and a bag of M&Ms. The couple were in the next parking spot over. White paint all but covered the back windows. Just married. Brian and Kira forever. X-O-X-O-X. Heart, heart, heart. An X-rated stick figure drawing someone had tried to smudge off the window. I grinned. Four or five A-L-8-1 aluminum cans tied to the back bumper. I was mumbling along to brown-eyed girl, playing on the radio, and casually glanced over. They had started making out, like gophers trying to propagate the frickin' planet. I glued my face to my phone, still bopping with Van Morrison. I flicked my eyes back up to check on the crazy kids before backing out of the parking spot, but they were full grin staring at me through the driver's side window. Brian had a lipstick-stained smirk as he la di da with me. But Kira Forever was belting it out so loud I could hear her voice through the glass. Not half bad, even at enamored bride volume. Head back, her natural curls bounced against the top of their car. We sang the last verse, the three of us, the newlyweds and the stranger. When the song was over, the girl jumped out of the car and ran over. Brian scratched his head, then opened his door. Wiping my melted chocolate hands on my jeans, I got out too. There's something about silently sharing music with a stranger. The hush. The inhale. Watching their mouth form the word you're singing. Connection. Delicate and cloud-shaped. Through two panes of tempered automobile glass. I asked them where they were from. They asked me where I was going. Kira wiggled on the balls of her kid sneakers with lace and told me about their honeymoon plan. She wanted to line dance in a real Nashville bar. He just wanted pancakes somewhere. They both had to be back at work at the factory on Monday. I gave them five bucks and my congratulations. I meant it. I live alone. I eat alone. I work alone. But singing with them, I felt connected. Somehow that song tied us together for that moment of humid Kentucky time. That first time, there were words, names, burned like an afterimage wavering right outside my windshield. But I didn't pay much attention. Just thought I was tired. When their photos popped up on the evening news, overturned semi on I-65 kills two. I remembered their names and put my fist through the wall. After that, there was Martina Marie Sanchez Broomheld, age 34, passed away surrounded by family after a courageous battle with ovarian cancer in Knoxville, Tennessee. We sang Despacito together. She glanced out of the passenger window through the rain, drawn and huddled in a fleece pullover, and caught me with a thin smirk as I stumbled through the Spanish chorus. And happy birthday with A.J. Du Bois, age six. Damn it. I had no idea why that song was playing on my radio until I turned the corner and saw the wreck. I held A.J.'s hand because there was no one else left alive by that time. Just a grocery store birthday card playing the same tinny tune sprawled across the broken window. Six green balloons in the back of the smashed SUV and... Happy birthday, dear AJ. Happy birthday to you. I tried to stop it from happening. My car radio refused to turn off, so I smashed it. And yet it played. Pried it out and hauled it to a dumpster behind the Burger King. Next morning, there it was. Brand spanking fracking new in the dash. I tried working from home so I wouldn't have to drive. Oh, I thought I was on to something then. I wore earplugs when I had to leave the apartment. But do you have any idea how many doctor's offices and stores have Spotify radio playlists turned up to 11 on loop? All it took was one head bop, one mouthed word, and someone was grinning at me. I used to think it was ridiculous. Batman swooping in on a crime right as it happened. 
Captain America just hoisting his shield when the bad guys get up to something. But that's how it is. The universe lines us up, puts us in each other's paths. These doomed people in me. It turns out the only thing harder to avoid than a snippet of a melody is a damn flicker of connection. That briefest moment when a stranger and I align our fates for a few notes. And I don't want it. This morning, I'm taking the bus to a new job. Amazon is always hiring during the holidays. My folks are gone, have been since I was 20. Not too interested in all the ho-ho-ho and family sing-along stuff, so I won't mind pulling some overtime sorting boxes. There's a split layer of snow on the ground when the bus pulls up and I get on. Next to me, the dreadlocked black man's headphones start to play the same song that was in my head so loud that I can hear it. Let it go from Disney's Frozen. Not falling for it, universe. Not today. Go pick on some other schmuck. I forget myself and mouth three words of the chorus. He nudges me and smiles as he sings along in a baritone fit for Broadway. Before I know it, a single word flashes in front of me. Then another. Then a line of words, like defiant poem stanzas between the trees and bridges and buildings as the bus chugs along. Jeffrey Alexander Whitson age 44, passed away in Catlettsburg, Tennessee on November 23rd, 2022. Mr. Whitson was earning his culinary degree and spent his free time volunteering at Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. A barbecue dinner will be served for all family and friends in the Springs Baptist Church basement at 4 p.m. on Saturday following the service. I ride the bus till he gets off and follow him into a bank like a lunatic sidekick. It's my first day on the new job, but screw it. He laughs when I tell him what I know, when I beg him to go home and stay home for the rest of the day. Are you kidding? I've got a girl to propose to tonight. You don't understand. Briefly, I think about asking the bank teller to help me make my case, but what would be the point? No one would believe me. No one will help me save him. I've got to do this on my own. The man laughs again. Then he gets mad. Because what sort of jackass goes around proclaiming imminent death on a random Tuesday? When security hauls me outside, I cry. Jeffrey Whitson, the guy who grinned at me on the bus with a mouthful of braces and Elsa angst, is going to die today. And I can't stop it. I make it to my new job, three hours late, eyes red-rimmed. Mercifully, they're slammed, so they still need me. I rack my brain for ideas while I sit through the safety orientation at Amazon. Hell, I'm not going to even open my mouth except to order a Big Mac No Onion or to tell off the froofy politicians spouting their lies on cable TV as I slouch in the comfort of my plaid couch. I just want these strangers to stop dying. After my shift, my lips sticking together from staying sealed all day, I slink into the suburban library near my apartment. Libraries are quiet. You play a song in there and some allied librarian will kick the crap out of you. I like the library. There's a girl here. Sophia, her name tag says. With blonde hair and skin so pale it's almost translucent. Freckles like a stripe of stars across her nose. I think she's taping barcodes on new books. I watch her through the half-open workroom door as I pretend to read a fraying Tom Clancy. Holy patriotic good old boys, Batman. Clancy loves to hear himself right. I put it down after about 30 minutes and look at Sophia. Each spine, she aligns with narrow-eyed precision. Each book slots into alphabetical order. All of a sudden, she jumps up, lets out a moaning yell, and her chair crashes to the floor. She shakes her hands in front of her, over and over, over and over. The librarian sitting at the circulation desk slips into the workroom from the other door. Sophia hits her head with her fist and I bite my lip. Staying away, keeping quiet is the plan now, but I've got to do something for this woman. My hands shake as I stand up. I pray there's no random song from a phone or a car blasting its radio outside. I come closer and just stand there. Maybe standing counts as showing up? What the hell do I know? The librarian, her name tag says Esme, touches her own cheek, then scoots into Sophia's line of sight. Esme's hands move, 
sign language. Sophia shakes her head and gives a thumbs down with the hand that's not striking her head. I ease into the room, keeping quiet, but Esme, without taking her eyes off Sophia, says, We're okay. Sophia's deaf, and we're okay. She gets upset sometimes when barcodes get stuck together. All the while, her hands are moving, talking without words, to Sophia. I tow the rubber base on the wall next to the door. My shoulders relax when Sophia stops hurting herself. She gives a quick thumbs up and sits cross-legged on the floor, her back now to me. Esme offers me a small smile, then says out loud, Would you like a drink of water, Sophia? Her hands move, signing the same words to Sophia, I assume. I stand there till Esme raises a brow at me. (sighs) I'm dense as crap. In a minute, I'm back with a paper cup of water from the drinking fountain near the bathrooms. I bump into the doorframe, feeling like a praying mantis with too damn many arms and legs. I place the water cup near Sophia, back up to the door, and ask Esme to tell Sophia with her hands that she's doing a great job on the books. I haven't said a word all day. My voice comes out all froggy. Soon, Esme goes back out front to help a patron. Sophia is still on the floor, so I edge into the workroom again. I slide down the wall and sit so she can see me out of the corner of her eye. She doesn't look at me, but I see her mouth turn up in a small smile. I give her a thumbs up, open my Tom Clancy again, and stay for another hour. All is calm, all is bright. I knew this moment would come. Didn't know it would be in the library parking lot with the radio Christmas song. It's my day off. Been coming here every few days when I can. I figured with my new rock-solid commitment to never open my mouth, I could risk driving today. It was just so snowy and cold. I dig into the nail indentations in my car and glance over at the bubblegum pink-haired girl with warm brown skin and the VW bug next to me. She's into the song, big time. Even got that Elvis lip curl going. Sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night. Holy night. Her pink phone vibrates on the dash and she picks it up, turning down the radio. I fiddle with a dial on my car stereo, trying to lower the volume. It's playing the same song. She steals a glance at me, then covers her face, talking into the phone. Whatever it is, it's not good news. It's been longer for me than I'd like to admit, but I know a breakup call when I see one. Poor kid. My radio chooses that moment to blast full volume. I see her mascara trailing down into the corners of her mouth. See her mouthed words through both of our rolled-up car windows. Shepherds quake at the sight. Glory stream from heaven afar. She pauses in a song. My radio is thrumming Elvis's words too. She points to her dash radio, then motions between her car and mine with a teary smile. I shake my head, pretending I don't know what she's asking, even though I know she wants me to sing with her. Please, she says, the words silent in my ears. Even though I don't understand why, I know it's all up to me. I feel her red-rimmed eyes on me as I turn away without joining in her song. I feel like a monster as I'm saving her life. On my way home, it starts to snow again. Just windy flurries. That girl, the Christmas Elvis lover. I think I just saved her. I think I did it. And all on my own. When I get to my apartment's parking lot, I get out into the cold night air and stare at the streetlight. Flakes fly like mini tornadoes, only visible in the cone of light. I grin, because it's kind of beautiful in a clunky suburban way. Then the snowflakes smash together like magnets. They form words. Cassidy Vinny, 19, died December 2nd, 2022 in Knoxville, Tennessee. She was born February 28, 2003, in Augusta, Georgia. Cassidy is survived by many friends and her paternal grandparents, Lily and Gavin Vinny, who raised her. A memorial service will be held Wednesday, December 7th, 
at Victor Ash Park. Donations may be sent to the Trevor Project. Website included below. I lock myself in my apartment. Forget the new job. Forget the library. Forget Sophia with the stars on her face. Though I have to admit that'll be harder to do. I'll never leave again. The image of Cassidy's pink hair burns in my mind when I'm awake, when I try to sleep. When I finally leave the apartment, days later, I pretend I'm going to get the icy hell out of Dodge, make a beeline for some place where no one listens to music, wherever that is. But those words in the snow already know where I'm going, and I do too. I drive to Victor Ash Park in Knoxville, smashing the pedal to the floorboards. I don't know what I hope to find. Her grandpa sitting on a park bench? A place to sign my condolences in a mild-colored notebook with a Target barcode still adhered to the back? A shock of bubblegum pink hair among the maple trunks? I don't know how long it takes for the last notes of a soul to flee on still air. I don't know where a person's melody goes. Does it trip over itself like the highest octave keys, or is it more of a five-finger death punch throwdown type thing at the end? Even if I couldn't save her, I've decided to believe that Cassidy's song, her soul, goes somewhere, somewhere calm and bright. I rush among the leafless trees and trails. At the edge of a small pond, I see a deflated balloon and a wilted bunch of sunflowers. Her name on a program. Her picture with that hair. Pink is hope. The service is over, but death has time to wait. I feel dumb as shit but I queue up Elvis's Christmas album on my phone. Looking out towards the muddy pond, I sing Cassidy every damn word of that damn song. It's cold. The wind cuts through my t-shirt and whispers to me what I know, what I've probably always known. I can't stop it. If I wave my hands and shout, they don't listen. If I follow them, they think I'm crazy. If I don't sing, they still die. I thought it was up to me, but I'm helpless. Stuck in this loop of melodies and words signaling the end of someone's life. It's not me killing them, but they keep dying anyway. The next day, I sit in the library with Sophia again for four hours. I don't read. We don't talk. The day after, I go again. And the next. After about a week, Esme brings me a stack of books. Not a Tom Clancy among them. A couple of thin scholastic copies of Shakespeare plays, one fracking thick Shakespeare anthology, and a book on American Sign Language. You got the wrong guy if you think I want to read all of... Sophia set them aside for you, Esme interrupts. Sophia scratches her nose. I find my spot on the floor and open the sign language book. It's Tuesday, two days before New Year's Eve. I've got no job, nowhere to be. The library and its silence haven't let me down yet, so I join Sophia in the workroom. She expects me now, and that feels good. Sometimes I tell her about the book I'm reading. I hope, someday, in her own way, she'll tell me a thing or two as well. Today she's standing at the end of the table, trucking away at her barcodes as usual. I sit down, Still clutching that same Tom Clancy, but I'm bumbling through the Tempest now, too, on good days. Not today. I'm sad all the time, I tell her. It feels strange to really talk to someone, but I'm tired of going it alone. She watches the words leave my mouth. I know she knows what I'm saying. It's just, words don't mean the same things to her as they do to other people. I kind of like that. My story comes out, a few words at a time. In between the paragraphs, I read silently to myself about Jack Ryan saving the world. I thought not singing with them would save them, but it doesn't work like that. Instead, I stole something from her, from Cassidy Vinny, age 19. Sophia's hands move over the books and barcodes. She stacks one book to the side every now and again, but her eyes stay on my mouth. She's listening, but I can tell it's hard for her. I need to dig deeper into that sign language book. I mash my palms to my eyes. 
Singing with someone, it's fun. Just a little zing of connection in this shit assed world. With that, I clamp my mouth shut. She's never going to believe my story anyway. Why did I get carried away talking to her like that? We usually just share silence together. I scratch my head and find my place in the book again. Sophia stacks two more books to the side. She puts a barcode on a children's board book, but it's a little crooked. She looks at me and bites her lip. Her hands make fists and rise into the air. I lean back in my plastic chair, stretch my arms out, and give her the biggest smile I can find. Then I yawn. This ain't no big thing, Sophia. I try to tell her with my body language. Her shoulders relax. Her fists unclench. She gets back to work. You're a damn cool cat, I tell her. Would you like some water? She nods. I hear someone humming to themselves as I walk back. I don't know the song, but I rush away anyway. I can't stop them from dying. I'm no savior. I'm just the fool who will sing you to your grave. I'm just one last smile before death's final kiss. After I place the cup in front of Sophia, I raise my fingers and a W at my chin and sign water. And it's probably hokey to hope she wants to spend time with me as much as I want to spend my time with her. But I don't want to miss anything she has to say, no matter how she says it. She looks up at me and rubs those freckles on her face again, and we stare at each other. Worlds and oceans of sentences, thoughts, songs, I can see them behind her eyes. I stare a moment longer and a dumb thought pops into my head. I could get used to this. Me and Sophia. If I can't sing with her... She shakes her head almost violently. I'm convinced she can read my thoughts on my face. She pats the floor where she has spread out a handful of books. My knees creak as I crouch on the library carpet. She points at the books, left to right, one at a time and gives me a look I can't understand. I shrug. Sophia makes a noise and her fists clench. She grabs my hand, makes my pointer finger stick out. Like the beats of a song, she moves my finger over the pages. Different place to each page, down the line of books, ending on the hardback cover of The Book Thief. I'm so lost. I want to understand. I just don't. This is on me, Sophia. I don't get it. She does it again. Again. Each time she lands my finger on Thief, the final note of her song. Same places each time. Oh, I'm dumb as shit. The rob that smiles steals. Something from the thief, I say, reading her words, her song, to me. Shakespeare's Othello. Esme has peeked her head around the corner of the workroom. She's putting on her coat. I haven't come by a Shakespeare play yet that Sophia doesn't know mostly by heart. Uh, we close in ten minutes. She taps the doorframe and disappears. My finger starts to move again, led by Sophia. Not thief. She punches my own finger into my knee. Not thief. She's telling me it's not my fault. Not my job. I'm not a superhero. I don't have to be. All those people, they were going to die anyway, I say. It hurts, but it feels true. It isn't a job I have to do right. It's a gift. A gift I was given to give back to them in the face of death. Connection. Light as a cloud, as invisible as a tune, soft as freckles across pale cheeks. Thought I had to do this alone. Turns out, I was the one who needed saving. I feel like Sophia knew that all along. She smiles. You're right, Sophia. I got to smile at that thief death for as long as I can. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't choked up. On the way home, my radio starts up. Three ascending horn notes. Doo doo doo. That 60s beat. A Domino's delivery woman pulls up beside me in a Toyota Camry with that illuminated blue and red beacon on top. Neil Diamond starts singing about that girl, Sweet Caroline. I'm already crying again, but I nod my head to the beat anyway. Our windows are rolled up, but the delivery driver turns her head to me, already singing along. 
When she sees my mouth forming the same words, I watch her say, no way, no way. And then we're singing together again. I don't even know her name. Not yet. I'm just the musical finale number. Big hands, big dance, the last hurrah, the last smile. So I make it a good one and smile in spite of that thief. Picturing Sophia's grin helps. And she was right. Joy floods me. It almost makes me giddy. We're hamming it up at the red light. The delivery woman smacks her palm against the window, and I lunge over the center console to tap my fingertips to the passenger side window. Neil's singing about hands, touching hands. We're pointing at each other, pointing at ourselves. My vision is a sea of red swimming brake lights. She's crying now, too. It's just a moment so silly, so dumb, so full. Worth every note. Worth the smile in the face of death. I sing to her, and she sings to me. Sweet Caroline, bum bum bum. The light turns green. I wipe my wet eyes and look to the road. A pair of headlights, blinding my eyes, blinding my brain, speed straight towards me. Crunching metal drowns out the sounds of Neil Diamond. And for a moment, I'm confused. The universe messed up and got the wrong guy. I've just figured things out. I'm not the villain. Certainly not the hero, just the singing fool. The air freshener tag of my rearview mirror flies off, thumps me in the shoulder. I get a strong whiff of pine and then watch it land in the empty passenger seat beside me. And then I understand. That woman wasn't hearing the same song as me. I think of Sophia, her barcodes her banner of stars. She showed me I don't have to be the hero. I'm just an ordinary guy living his life. Ordinary people die every day. Neil Diamond and the Domino's delivery woman sending me out, full of joy and a song. I heard the same song she did, and I sang along. That was The Fool Who Sings You to Your Grave by Katie Servanek. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen to us on. Or, better yet, share the magazine and podcast with a friend. If you'd like to listen to more speculative fiction, visit us online at magazine.metaphoricist.com or on Twitter at metaphoricistmag.com.